This lecture is on the famous two American composers, George Gershwin and Aaron Copland. George Gershwin, initially his name was Gershwitz, Gershwin, and then finally Gershwin as we know it today. His dates, 1898 to 1937. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. He studied piano with Charles Hambitzer. And as a pianist, he took a job as a song plugger at Remick Music Publisher Company. What that is, is that when the pianos pound, song pluggers play tunes. And that's the reason why he was called a song plugger. He was working in Timpan Alley, which was the district center for composers and publishers of pop music. He was a great duo with his brother Ira. Ira wrote words and George wrote the music. And a lot of songs during this time period um, are by George and Ira Gershwin. One of the works that we're going to talk about is The Rhapsody in Blue. Most of you, I'm sure, have heard it or have heard some part of it. Um, it's one of his most famous works. He composed it in 1924, and it was created for piano and jazz band. Now, this was very innovative because, as we remember from the past, usually if it was piano accompanied by some kind of a large ensemble, it was an orchestra. Now, I will tell you that even though it originally was written for piano and jazz band, there are many, many arrangements of it for piano and orchestra, other ensembles with piano, and even a piano solo version. Paul Whiteman was the band leader, and he had asked Gershwin to compose this piece for a concert of his. It was called An Experiment in Music, and he asked Gershwin one month before the performance if he would do this. Uh, Paul Whiteman realized that for classical players um, in the classical world, the jazz elements really kind of like were separate from the classical world. And he felt that Gershwin with this experiment in music could actually bridge the gap between the classical world and the jazz world. So Paul Whiteman, the band leader, he announced Gershwin's participation in the New York Tribune without even Gershwin's knowledge. He finds out about it, and he writes this Rhapsody in Blue. Now, you got to remember, a rhapsody in music is a one-movement work that's episodic, yet integrated, free-flowing in structure, featuring a range of highly contrasted moods, color, and tonality. And there is this air of spontaneous inspiration and a sense of improvisation. And you hear all of this in the the Rhapsody in Blue, so it was very appropriately named. Uh, it was orchestrated by Ferdy Groff, but a couple of pieces of trivia that you might not know about the Rhapsody in Blue is the first score was missing piano parts, meaning that uh, Gershwin would just um, instruct the conductor to wait to cue the orchestra after his piano solos. The other thing that I wanted you to know is, is that that beginning 17-note gliss Glissando, where the, the clarinet goes all the way up, uh, was originally just a joke at a rehearsal, and because everybody liked it, it was kept. There is a section in the Rhapsody in Blue that kind of reminds you of a train because it sounds like it's accelerating and it's very rhythmic. And Gershwin says in his um, diaries, I was on a train with its steely rhythms. So that's where that actually comes from. Leonard Bernstein, the composer that we're going to see in the following video, uh, was a pianist who performed Rhapsody in Blue many times, and he describes the Rhapsody best. He says, and I quote, the Rhapsody is not a composition at all. It's a string of separate paragraphs stuck together. The themes are terrific, inspired, and God-given. You could remove any of these stuck-together sections, and it is still Rhapsody in Blue. I also wanted you to know that Gershwin did record the Rhapsody twice with Whiteman, once acoustically in 1924, and on electrostatic 
of, uh, on electrostatic recording in 1927. He also made a piano roll. The recording that I actually put on YouTube for you to listen to is, uh, is Gershwin performing his Rhapsody in Blue. I also wanted to make note of the United connection with Rhapsody in Blue. Uh, United paid an annual fee of $300,000 since 1987 because it was the first commercial to use the Rhapsody in Blue and that it was the compensation for using the tune that is known as Rhapsody in Blue. You have to remember that um, Gershwin really did was a connector from the classical world to the jazz world. Um, as you may have read or will read from your uh, designated um, writings of Gershwin, he wrote a lot about jazz um, because he really was, um, he really wanted to be able to create this bridge. Some of the famous quotes that come from Gershwin are, True music must repeat the thoughts and inspirations of the people in the time. My people are Americans and my time is today. He also said about jazz, I regard as a, a jazz I regard as an American folk music, not the only one, but a very powerful one, in which is probably the blood and feeling of the American people more than any other style of folk music. I believe that it could be made the basis of serious uh, symphonic works of lasting value in the hands of a composer with talent for both jazz and symphonic music. You have to remember that Gershwin was also famous internationally. And there is a story, Maurice Ravel, a French composer uh, from the Impressionist period and very interested in jazz, and in fact incorporated a lot of jazz elements in his piano concerto and his violin sonata, um, was uh, talking with Gershwin and Gershwin was very interested in studying with Ravel. And Ravel's response to Gershwin was, why should you be a second rate Ravel when you can be a first rate Gershwin? The other work that was groundbreaking um, as a folk opera was Porgy and Bess. 1934 is a folk opera in three acts. Um, and Gershwin talks about this sense of a folk opera because this was a very new concept. We talked about operas in the Romantic period. They were not folk operas. He says, and I quote, this is Gershwin talking, Porgy and Bess is a folk tale. Its people naturally would sing folk music. When I first began work in the music, I decided against use of original folk materials because I wanted the music to be all of one piece. Therefore, I wrote my own spirituals and folk songs, but they are still folk music, and therefore being an operatic form, Porgy and Bess becomes a folk opera. The storyline, it's based on a novel by Du Bois Hayward, a native of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the uh, lyrics are by Hayward, as well as Ira uh, Gershwin's brother. It takes place in Charleston, South Carolina on Catfish Row. The storyline has the characters of Porgy, a disabled beggar who falls in love with Bess, who has hit her, um, her own uh, boyfriend, Crown, who is like a thug, who has actually killed somebody, walks away from the situation, and that's when Porgy falls in love with Bess. And the other thing that happens is, is that Porgy kills Crown, Bess's boyfriend. And another character of this, uh, Porgy and Bess is sport in life. And he is the dope peddler. Uh, he's not a very good influence for Bess and ultimately convinces her to go to New York. And in that very last scene, Porgy is going to go and find her in New York. I've selected uh, three parts, the very famous summertime at the very beginning, the Porgy and Bess love duo, and the final scene when Porgy is going to go look for his love, Bess. The importance of this work as a first is the fact that it was a folk opera with dialogue 
and it also featured an all Afro-American cast. Unfortunately, we lost Gershwin at the age of 39 from a brain tumor, but he changed the way the classical world looked at jazz. The other uh, composer that I wanted to talk about was Aaron Kirchner. He was an educator, a conductor, as well as a composer. His dates are 1900 to 1990, and he was also born in Brooklyn, New York, like Gershwin. His teacher was Ruben Goldmark, who had studied with Dvorak, who was an important European uh, composer in the Romantic period. Copeland actually goes to uh, Paris to study. He enrolls at the Fountain Blue, and he studies with the very famous uh, composer as well as teacher, Nadia Boulanger. Well, Nadia Boulanger becomes a very important teacher to a lot of American composers. Not only did he uh, study with Nadia Boulanger, but while he was working with her, Kusevitsky, an American conductor and a supporter of uh, young artists, was very taken by Copeland. And so he commissioned a work that Copeland would write featuring Nadia Boulanger at the organ. And it was called Symphony for Organ and Orchestra. And Boulanger ultimately was the soloist in this work because of this famous conductor Kusevitsky. Copeland was known to use jazz rhythms, American folk songs, 12 tone works, American nationalism in his composition, and he was known as the Dean of American Composers. What's interesting though, even though he was considered the Dean of American Composers and he was very famous throughout his lifetime, he was investigated by the FBI during the Red Scare. Um, he was actually questioned by Joseph McCarthy. Um, he had strong support of the Progressive Party candidate, uh, Hen uh, candidate um, Henry Wallace in 1948, and he was thought to have communist connections. So therefore, he was blacklisted to the point where his famous Lincoln portrait was withdrawn from the inaugural concert for Eisenhower. Copeland was famous for his ballet repertoire, but unlike Tchaikovsky, who in the Romantic period composed separate from the choreographer, Copeland actually collaborated very closely with his choreographers. His Billy the Kid Ballet of 1938 was commissioned by Lincoln Kirstein, head of the American Ballet and New York City Ballet with George Balanchine, originally with the Ballet Russe. It was choreographed by Eugene Loring for the Ballet Caravan and the story was, uh, um, of the ballet was based on the very famous outlaw, American outlaw, William Bonet, whose dates were 1859 to 1881. Another one of his ballets was Rodeo in 1942. It was choreographed by Agnes DeMille and had the storyline of a cowgirl who gets her champion roper. The famous part of this is the hoedown, which is part of this ballet. And the third ballet is the Appalachian Spring, which premiered in 1944. It was commissioned and choreographed by the famous modern dancer, Martha Graham, who actually, um, he, she not only choreographed it, but she danced in it. And you will see the version where she is the lead um, dancer. It was definitely a, um, a ballet with a, an American theme, Copeland only got $500 for it. He was funded by Coolidge's foundation, which was Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge would give out money. And the performance took place, the initial performance took place at the Library of Congress, and Martha Graham was the lead dancer. In 1945, Copeland received the Pulitzer Prize for the ballet. And initially, the ballet was accompanied by a 13-piece chamber orchestra. This ballet was originally called Ballet for Martha. And you can guess that Copeland definitely composed it for Martha Graham with Martha Graham's ideas incorporated all the way through. Very different style of dancing when you watch this. 
than Tchaikovsky's Toe Shoes and Tutus. I would like you to watch the first part of this ballet, as well as the section featuring uh, the famous Shaker tune, Tis the Gift to be Simple. Now, people always thought that the title for Appalachian Spring came from the geographical area of Appalachian Spring, but it actually comes from a poem. Uh, before the premiere, Martha uh, suggested um, the, for the title, the poem Appalachian Spring, uh, and this poem is by Hart Crane called The Dance from a collection of poems from the bridge that caught her attention. And this is how the poem goes. O oh, Appalachian Spring, I gain the ledge, steep and accessible smile that eastward bends, and nothing reaches in that violet wedge of the Adirondacks. Spring, source of water in poem, a poem about the journey to meet springtime. In this work, you will meet the wife, the husband, the preacher, the pioneer women, and the worshiper, woman and the worshipers. What's interesting about this is, is that all three of these ballets were so popular that orchestral suites, uh, that is versions of the music performed by orchestra, without the ballet became popular for orchestral repertoire on the concert stage. The last selection that I wanted you to hear by Copeland is the famous Fanfare for the Common Man in 1942. It was commissioned by Eugene Gossams, the conductor of the Cincinnati Symphony. During World War II, fanfares would be presented before each concert by American composers. And there were 18 of them in all, and this was one of them. The fanfare was inspired by the 1942 famous speech by Vice President Henry Wallace, proclaiming the dawning of the century for the common man. It was orchestrated for brass and percussion and it also appears in Copland's Third Symphony, Last Movement. I want you to meet Aaron Copeland through his autobiography, as well as his interviews. A wonderful way to know and understand this composer through his own words and understand his personality. When I watch his interviews, it brings back great memories of meeting Aaron Copeland at Tanglewood as a little girl and sitting on a sofa, talking about his piano piece, The Cat and the Mouse. <laughs> 